This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. President Biden proposing sweeping changes to the Supreme Court as Vice President Kamala Harris also gets on board. But Republicans warn it would erode the rule of law. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao brings us more from Washington, D.C. President Biden in an op-ed in the Washington Post today called for three sweeping changes. First, to add an 18-year term limit to the Supreme Court justices, which would ensure a regular turnover of them. And in Biden's work, quote, reduce the chance that any single presidency radically alters the makeup of the court for generations. Second, President Biden suggests that there should be a binding and forcible ethics code for the high court. And third, the president wants a constitutional amendment that would prohibit blanket immunity for presidents. And Biden calling for these changes in a speech in Texas. Watch. The president is no longer constrained by the law. And only limits on abuse of power will be self-imposed by the president alone. That's a fundamentally flawed view and a fundamentally flawed principle. And Biden's Monday proposal comes after a slew of major Supreme Court rulings, including the ones overturning Roe versus Wade, ending affirmative action in college admissions, and just recently granting former President Trump broad immunity for his official acts while in office. A White House official today said this about what directly prompted President Biden to make these calls. Watch. And certainly uh, the Supreme Court's ruling this past month, I think, would probably say, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, say maybe an immediate cause. In his op-ed, President Biden says he has great respect for separation of powers, but, quote, what is happening now is not normal, adding that it undermines the public's confidence in the court's decisions. Vice President Kamala Harris says she's fully on board with these changes, saying they will strengthen democracy. The Republicans are strongly criticizing the plan. They decided the time has come to eliminate the Supreme Court as we know it. Never mind what the Constitution says. Meanwhile, the chances of Biden's plans actually coming true are extremely slim, if not even non-existent. Biden's proposal for term limits and ethics code will need 60 votes to pass the Senate, and Democrats only have 51 seats. And passing a constitutional amendment is even more difficult, as it would require two-thirds of support from both chambers. And House Speaker Mike Johnson today called Biden's plan a dangerous gambit, adding that it will be dead on arrival in the House. Reporting from the Supreme Court, Iris Tao, NTD News. We are just 99 days away from the presidential election. This follows a historic and certainly unpredictable month on the campaign trail. Today, Governors Josh Shapiro and Gretchen Whitmer campaign on behalf of 2024 Democratic presidential candidate and Vice President Kamala Harris at Bucks County, Pennsylvania. NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley is at the White House with the latest on the race. We're now less than 100 days away from Election Day, and there's still so much more to look forward to. This week, delegates will vote to elect Vice President Kamala Harris as their uh, nominee for the Democratic Party. Convention delegates will vote with an electronic ballot, and they're expected to nominate her and a VP candidate by August 7th. That's ahead of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in mid-August. Now, Harris is expected to announce a VP pick in early August, and among the many likely candidates are Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, and Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. One focus of the Harris campaign has been to reach out to younger voters. Watch. In 2020, it was young voters who turned out in record numbers and elected Joe Biden, President of the United States, and me, the first woman elected Vice President of the United States. Because young voters showed up, we have made so much progress, historic progress, on everything from gun violence prevention to taking on the climate crisis. Over the weekend, former President Trump and J.D. Vance, senator from Ohio, held a rally in St. Cloud, Michigan. Much of the focus was on cracking down on illegal immigration and protecting the right to bear arms. And I will fully uphold our Second Amendment, which, as you know, is under siege. As you know, I got the full and total support of the NRA. They totally endorsed me and support me, but it is under siege, our Second Amendment. And nothing happened with us. We kept it and we will keep it. And this week, Harris and Trump will hold campaign rallies in some critical swing states. And what we have to look forward to as we lean into November is uh, potential presidential debates between Harris and Trump and their running mates. Reporting from the White House, Jack Bradley, NTD News. 
The local SWAT team on the ground at the Pennsylvania rally speaks out for the first time following the attempt to assassinate former President Trump. The officers described a lack of communication with the Secret Service. On Sunday's Good Morning America, lead sharpshooter Jason Woods said we were supposed to get a face-to-face -face briefing with the Secret Service members whenever they arrived, and that never happened. The officers said they did what they could to prevent the attack and now have to live with the failure. The Beaver County SWAT team early on identified the gunman as suspicious and even took a photo of him. The FBI today said that the gunman had engaged in careful planning ahead of the rally, mostly through online research. The gunman had also used a drone to scope out the venue. Trump will soon speak with the FBI for a victim interview, but its timing is not yet confirmed. As for Congress's investigation, House leaders announced the new bipartisan task force, seven Republicans and six Democrats. They'll have full subpoena power to get to the bottom of the security failures. Its findings will be made public in a report no later than December 13th. And tomorrow, the acting Secret Service director is coming to Capitol Hill to testify alongside the FBI deputy director. Over the weekend, a rocket attack in northern Israel killed 12 children and teenagers on a soccer field. Israel has vowed to retaliate against Hezbollah, creating uncertainty for the future of Lebanon. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. On Saturday, as sirens sounded in northern Israel, the resident holding this camera scrambled to see what triggered the alarm when he saw an explosion in the distance. Then other residents came out to see what happened. The rocket hit a soccer field, killing 12 children and teenagers. The Israel Defense Forces, or the IDF, said Hezbollah was responsible for the strike. And markings on the remnants of the rocket used in the attack indicate that it was likely made in Iran. It's an awful tragedy, innocent boys and girls. It's just heartbreaking. I told you, Hezbollah is responsible and it will pay a price. And on Monday, flights to and from the capital of Lebanon have been canceled or delayed amid fears of an Israeli attack. Meanwhile, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan appeared to threaten that Turkey could join the war against Israel. Just like we entered Karabakh, just like we entered Libya, we might do similar to them. There is no reason why we cannot do this. We must be strong so that we can take these steps. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. stands by Israel's right to defend its citizens from terrorist attacks. And he added this. We also don't want to see the conflict escalate. We don't want to see it spread. That has been uh, one of our goals from day one, from, uh, from October 7th on. The U.S. Embassy in Beirut warned American citizens in Lebanon to plan to leave before a crisis begins or be prepared to shelter in place for an extended period of time. Jason Perry, NTD News. Disputed election results in Venezuela today. The incumbent socialist leadership says it won the race. U.S. officials are now calling for transparency. NDD's international correspondent, Arian Pazdar, has more from South America. Venezuela's socialist president, Nicolas Maduro, and his party claim he won Sunday's presidential election. This comes after the National Electoral Council declared that Maduro got around 51% of the votes, while his challenger, Edmundo Gonzalez, received around 44%. But Venezuela's opposition says that the Electoral Council favors the ruling party. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says every vote must be counted fairly and transparently. We have serious concerns that the result announced does not reflect the will or the votes of the Venezuelan people. Venezuela's opposition claims it obtained voting tallies from about 30 percent of ballot boxes nationwide. And according to them, Gonzalez got around 70 percent of the vote, easily defeating Maduro. Some Venezuelan immigrants across the globe are now claiming election interference took place. In Argentina, supporters of the opposition cried, while others attacked metal fences at the Venezuelan embassy. Around 8 million people left Venezuela since Maduro became president. Many emigrated to the U.S., but a sizable number opted for nearby countries like Brazil, such as Juan, who came here in 2019. 
Do you know anyone outside of Venezuela who was able to vote in this election? No person abroad was able to vote. Uh, they just didn't open the voting process abroad. The actual intent to vote inside the country is already majorly against the government. We're talking about over 60% of the population, so about 7 out of 10 Venezuelans would be voting against the government, and that's even greater if you go abroad, because most of the people that have left the country have a deep resentment against this government. Florida Senator Marco Rubio claimed that the Maduro regime in Venezuela has just carried out the most predictable and ridiculous sham election in modern history. Now, after their results were announced on Sunday night, the opposition said that they haven't actually seen the votes. They now want the electoral authorities to show them the results issued by the voting machines. The White House on Monday made similar demands. The U.S. and uh, the international community uh, will continue to call on the authorities to release those tabulated results without delay. The White House was also asked if the U.S. considers to increase sanctions if Venezuela doesn't release the votes. The spokesperson said they won't talk about possible consequences just yet. Reporting in Brazil, Ariane Pastar, NTD News. We continue to follow the knife attack in England that has killed two children and wounded 11 others today. British police are providing the latest updates. It is understood that the children were attending a Taylor Swift event at a dance school when the offender, armed with a knife, walked into the premises and started to attack inside the children. We believe that the adults who were injured were bravely trying to protect the children who were being attacked. A 17-year-old male from Banks in Lancashire, who is originally from Cardiff, has been arrested on suspicion of murder and attempted murder and he's being taken to a police station where he will be interviewed by detectives. Police said eight of the 11 injured are in a critical condition, including six children and two adults. The attack happened in the town of Southport in northern England, north of Liverpool, at around 11.50 a.m. local time. Children attending the dance class were believed to be 6 to 11 years old. The investigation is in its early stages, and the attacker's motive remains unclear. The police said the incident was not treated as terror-related. Two women were killed and five others injured in a shooting in Rochester, New York. Gunfire erupted during a Sunday afternoon barbecue at a park. And here's the briefing from the Rochester Police Department today. Sadly, last night we responded to another act of mass violence here in our community. At approximately 6.20 p.m. last night, the Rochester Police Department responded in Maplewood Park near Bridgeview Drive for a report of shots fired. Officers arrived to find multiple people that had been shot at a large gathering in the park. A total of seven people were treated at local hospitals for their injuries sustained from gunfire. Preliminarily, it appears that hundreds of people were gathered in the park for a barbecue. At some point, rounds were fired from multiple weapons, striking the victims. There were hundreds of people at this barbecue, and therefore, there are hundreds of people who have potential information to help us solve this crime. Police Captain Greg Bellow said they don't know how many people were involved in the shooting. No suspects are in custody. Police ask anyone with video of the shooting to call 311 or 911. Wildfires across the western U.S. and Canada have put millions of people under air quality alerts as thousands of firefighters battle the flames, including the largest wildfire in California this year. NTD's Eileen Eng brings us the update. Thousands of firefighters are still battling the ever-growing park fire in Northern California after the blaze more than doubled in size in a 24-hour span over the weekend. According to Cal Fire, the blaze had burned more than 360,000 acres, about 90 miles north of the state capital city of Sacramento as of Monday morning. Firefighters could be seen lighting backfires Sunday afternoon as cooler temperatures and more humid air are potentially helping efforts to slow the spread of the fire. The fire has destroyed 134 structures and is 12 percent contained as of Monday morning. Evacuation orders and warnings were issued for multiple communities in several counties, including a warning for Paradise, the town that was devastated by the 2018 campfire, the deadliest in the state's history. A man was arrested on July 25th on suspicion that he started the park fire by pushing a flaming car into a gully the day before. 
According to the National Interagency Fire Center, the fire is the largest of dozens of active wildfires across the country that have burned more than 2 million acres combined. A new abortion ban became law today in Iowa. The law bans abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. The state's previous ban was up to 20 weeks of pregnancy. The American Civil Liberties Union challenged the new law after Iowa lawmakers passed it last year. It took effect for a few days before a district court judge blocked it. Iowa Republican Governor Kim Reynolds appealed that decision to the state's high court, which ruled in her favor. Iowa is one of four states nationwide that ban abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. Meanwhile, 14 states have near total bans at all stages of pregnancy. The Iowa Supreme Court's decision follows the ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court that says there is no constitutional right to abortion. New polling from CNN Out Today indicates a vast majority of current renters feel like the American dream of home ownership is out of reach. And it's no surprise they feel that way. An average starter home in more than 200 cities has exceeded the $1 million mark. That's according to Zillow Research. Brian Abel is breaking down the data and how these skyrocketing prices happened. We got an affordability crisis across the country. A staggering statistic. In 237 cities in the United States, it will cost you at least $1 million to own a starter home, according to Zillow, defined as a home in the lowest third of values in that market. Homes that should be uh, easily accessible to, uh, to renters trying to get on the lowest rung of the housing ladder. Nearly half of those cities, 117 of them, are in California alone. Those are markets close to big job centers on the coasts, near the ocean, near lakes and mountains, right? Markets that tend to attract a lot of people. Zillow economist Orfe DeFungi says supply and demand is playing a big role in the skyrocketing prices. When mortgage rates doubled back in 2022, competition for smaller homes heated up, pushing up the price. But Ifungi says good news may be on the way for first-time buyers, with more homes for sale, price cuts on the rise, a potential interest rate cut soon, and buyers having more time to weigh options as homes stay on the market longer. His advice? Talk to a real estate agent. Having an agent find the homes within the locality, the area that will fit within your budget uh, is really the best way to, to, to tackle the home buying process today. In Washington, Brian Abel reporting. McDonald's reported a surprise drop in worldwide sales today. It's the fast food chain's first decline in more than three years. More expensive menu items have deal-seeking consumers looking for a burger and fries elsewhere. McDonald's sales in the U.S. fell 0.7% last quarter compared to the same period a year earlier. Globally, sales dropped 1%. It's the first time sales fell by that much since the last quarter of 2020 during the pandemic. Persistent inflation has forced lower income diners to shift to more affordable food options at home. That has led fast food chains such as McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's and Taco Bell to lean on value meals. McDonald's launched a $5 meal deal in June. The fast food chain CEO said new menu items are also in the works. In the midst of multiple legal challenges, TikTok is once again back in the spotlight. The Justice Department has accused the China-backed platform of harvesting user information on sensitive social issues. NTD's Sam Wong has the details. In a recent court filing, the DOJ said TikTok employees have transferred American user data to its Chinese parent company, ByteDance. The action was made possible through an internal web suite system called Lark, which allows TikTok workers to communicate directly with ByteDance engineers. Officials said the social media app collected users' opinions on sensitive topics, including abortion, religion, and gun rights restrictions. The federal government has long voiced concerns over national security risks surrounding TikTok and its ownership structure. Under ByteDance ownership structure, the Chinese government has the ability to manipulate TikTok's algorithm, surveil its users, and conduct influence operations that quietly populate Americans' For You pages. Earlier this year, President Biden signed a bill that requires TikTok to divest from ByteDance or else face a ban from all U.S. app stores. Officials said the platform is bound by Chinese law to support the work of the Chinese Communist Party. TikTok then responded with a lawsuit, saying the measure violates the First Amendment rights of its 170 million American users. 
As his survival hangs in the balance, the social media company has until January 19th next year to decide his fate. The latest court documents mark the federal government's first major defense against TikTok's lawsuit. Sam Wong, NTD News. Now we turn to the Indo-Pacific region. Top diplomats from the United States, Australia, India and Japan pledged today to bolster maritime security in the region. In their speeches, they refer to China, but without mentioning the country by name. We are charting a course for a more secure and open Indo-Pacific and Indian Ocean region by bolstering maritime security and domain awareness. These four countries from the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, commonly known as the Quad, the group is widely viewed as a response to China's increasing economic and military aggression. Chinese vessels have repeatedly clashed with Philippine ships in recent months. And for years, Beijing has kept building artificial islands in the South China Sea for military use. Also today, Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin met with Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio in Tokyo amid rising tensions with Japan's two communist neighbors, China and North Korea. Over the weekend, Blinken and Austin met their Japanese counterparts, upgrading military cooperation between the two countries. Following their Japan trip, Blinken and Austin are scheduled to travel to the Philippines. And join me now to analyze Biden's proposal for the Supreme Court are two guests. Dante Mills is attorney and founding partner at Mills and Edwards. And Jonathan Houlihan is general counsel and director of legal operations at Citizens Defending Freedom. Thank you both so much for joining us. Great to see you both again. Jonathan, I want to start with you. What is your legal analysis of the proposed limits on presidential immunity? What exactly does President Biden want to change? Well, I mean, you can see it with how it's the proposals named. No one is above the law act, right? So, so he really paints an extreme position of the Supreme Court that they've given this blanket immunity to President Trump and future presidents, which is simply not true. They actually took more of a middle of the road approach and painted what the founders envisioned is, is separation of powers and immunity for official acts. So there's no immunity for private acts or acts that took place outside of, of the executive branch or outside of the office. It's really immunity for executive branch official acts. And they want to paint this extreme position. They want to use this uh, proposal to either pack the Supreme Court, provide oversight of the Supreme Court, all in violation of the separation of powers. Hmm. And Dante, how might the proposed term limits impact the balance of power among the executive, legislative and judicial branches of government? This idea by President Joe Biden um, is bad. He needs to leave the Supreme Court alone. That's just the bottom line. Uh, the framers of the Constitution made sure that there was separation of powers, that no branch of government can have oversight or supersede the other. And that's how the Supreme Court is set up. I think allowing them to be appointed for life takes out and removes the politics from their position. If you have to run for the Supreme Court, or if you have term limits and you have to worry about if I make this uh, ruling or, or, or if I have this decision, will I be back? That's where you complicate things. So having Supreme Court justices who knows that they're there as long as they want to be, it gives them the freedom to follow their, their heart, their, what they believe is true with the law. And that's what we need. These people are vetted before they're allowed to sit. And that's where you make sure that you're sitting someone that's just going to follow the law as they believe it. And then you allow them to do that for the rest of their career. That's how it needs to, to remain. And Jonathan, what about the proposed term limits for justices? What would need to happen to turn this into a reality? Well, the first thing they would have to do is uh, propose a constitutional amendment, which would have to pass uh, the House, and then it would have to be ratified by the state. So this thing's dead on arrival. This is more uh, political grandstanding. This is probably a way to fundraise off of bad court decisions in their mind that they don't like but are, are good for the country, and it returns authority back to the people, back to the states, uh, and it really restores some of the separation of power. So this is just, uh, again, grandstanding, dead on arrival. It's not going to happen. And speaking of, you know, respect for the separation of powers, I mean, this is the same administration that got a ruling from the Supreme Court on student loan forgiveness, and then they just turn around and do it anyway. So maybe they need to take a look at the mirror uh, for no one is above the law act and uh, look at their own actions. And, Dante, and how Tiffany, if I can, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to piggyback off what Jonathan is saying. I think he makes a, a really good point that we don't want and we we should not have our politicians kind of grandstanding about the Supreme Court because what it does is the general public feeds into it. And we know this is not going to happen. They're not going to change the way the Supreme Court is set up. But when you do this, what you do is you make the general public suspect and and, and really start to second guess everything the Supreme Court is doing. And that's just not where we need to be. We need to be telling the American people that they should trust our system, that it has been put in place for a reason, that it survived hundreds of years uh, for a reason, and that we should just rely on that as opposed to pushing this idea forward that you know is not going to happen so that when the Supreme Court makes decisions, now everybody in the public second guesses them and thinks that their decisions are based on political, uh, you know, uh, for political reasons. And we shouldn't be doing that. We should allow the Supreme Court to do their job independently and focus on politics for politicians. Expanding on that, Dante, how might term limits influence future judicial nominations and the political dynamics surrounding them? It, it makes our legal system uh, a political spectrum. Um, and, and what it does is you're going to have judges that are running for office as opposed to uh, looking at cases and evaluating cases the way they believe the law decides. Now, we use these terms, uh, a liberal justice and a, a progressive justice, but that's not really what it is. It's two types of judges, one that looks at the black letter law and one that looks at the, the outcome um, and, and our outcome determinative. That's really what separates judges. So we need judges that both say this is what the law says no matter what the impact of that is, we got to follow the law. And then we need judges that say, well, I know the law says this, but it has a, a, a disparate impact. It's impacting people differently. And those two judges bring their minds together and they put forward what they believe is the best legal decision. We need to allow that to happen. That process is important in the law. I'm a lawyer. I value our legal system. We need to keep it separate from politics. And I think setting term limits, it just blurs the line. And Jonathan, what are the key arguments for and against a binding code of conduct? Well, I think the argument against it is uh, separation of powers. I mean, the executive branch can't put a binding code of conduct on the justices. I mean, they're by nature uh, impartial. That's the way it was set up. They have judicial review, uh, Marbury v. Madison. So the executive branch can't put a binding code of conduct on the Supreme Court. The framers already envisioned this. If you have a Supreme Court justice or any federal judge uh, that acts outside of their authority or, or makes bad decisions or whatever, they can be impeached or removed from the process that's already set up. Uh, you don't need to have this code of conduct from the executive branch set up, uh, which again, is just political posturing. And Jonathan, staying with you, could the proposed term limits and code of conduct impact the independence and impartiality of the Supreme Court? Well, absolutely. I mean, if, uh, if, if you have them, it could be part of the nomination process, part of the advi advice and consent process. Uh, they could really set up a lot of these justices for failure. And, and again, it politicizes the, the court. It makes them more of a political actor, second guessing every decision they make. It, it could be used to uh, weaponize the recusal process. You've already seen that in these cases with Justice Alito. Oh, he flew a flag. He flew a uh, uh uh, uh, a flag above his, his vacation home, and all of a sudden, oh, he has to recuse himself on the January 6th cases. So again, it's just ways to trap uh, the justices. They're acting way outside of their authority with the, even this proposal. Dante Mills. And Tiffany, if I may, just, yeah, yeah. So it's one thing that I do want to interject, though, is these justices, I do believe they should be left alone to do their job. But as a Supreme Court justice, I do think that you should take the onus to make sure that you stay clear of these issues because then you allow people to raise these arguments. So for example, Justice Alito, he should have not allowed that flag to be flown. I'm not saying it's illegal or that it means he's not um, you know, doing his job as a Supreme Court justice, but they can also take steps to make sure that they don't put themselves in the line of fire for these arguments. Um, and then I think it's an easier process for everybody that's involved. Dante Mills, Jonathan Houlihan, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you so thank you. much. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Vandals damaged multiple telecommunication lines in France today. It's the second incident at the games after arson attacks hit train networks across the country on Friday. 
NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest on the outage. Marina Ferrari, French Secretary of State in charge of digital affairs, said that the damage in several regions overnight affected some telecommunication companies. Telecom operators Bouygues and Free confirmed their services were affected. French media reported that lines operated by provider SFR were also hit. You really need to know the network to be able to intervene and cut the cables and do this kind of act of vandalism. Ferrari said the vandalism led to localized impacts on access to fiber, fixed and mobile phone lines. The effect on the Olympic Games wasn't immediately clear. A French police official said at least six of France's administrative departments were affected, including the region around the Mediterranean city of Marseille, which is hosting Olympic soccer and sailing competitions. Free's parent company said its teams have been mobilized to restore services. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Authorities in France suspect members of anarchist groups were behind the sabotage of the country's high-speed rail network last week. The attacks happened just as the Olympic Games were about to begin. Saboteurs struck the network on Friday with pre-dawn attacks. They targeted signal substations and cables at critical points. The violence caused travel chaos hours before the opening ceremony in Paris. France has been targeted in attacks by Islamic terrorists in recent years, but security services have been increasingly concerned about what they call far-left groups or anarchist militants who typically oppose the state and capitalism. The European police agency Europol said left-wing and anarchist groups typically attack critical infrastructure. Train services in France were back up and running early today. Teams worked around the clock over the weekend to fix the damage. The opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in Paris has sparked some controversy. Segments of the show featuring drag queen performances in a Christian setting face pushback from Christian groups and the Catholic Church. Organizers of the ceremony presented apologies yesterday. NTD's international correspondent David Vives spoke to a historian. Despite featuring stunning moments and beautiful scenes, the game's opening ceremony on Friday segments sparked outrage among some viewers. One of them resembled the biblical scene of Jesus Christ and his apostle sharing a last meal before crucifixion and featured drag queens, a transgender model and a naked singer made up as a Greek god of wine Dionysus. For French historian Marion Sigo, this was a desecration of France's history. They tried to make people believe that France was that. And I think that the French will feel violated. It's a violation of our history, of our integrity, of our feelings, of our most elementary feelings, which are humanity, which are the search for beauty and goodness. The scene has notably been censored and not broadcasted in Morocco and Algeria. In the U.S., NBC Channel broadcasted commercials and images of the U.S. Olympic teams instead of the scene. It also drew dismay among the Catholic Church and the religious right in America. Donald Trump Jr., Elon Musk and House Speaker Mike Johnson voiced to have spoken out about the scene. Paris 2024 organizers apologized on Sunday to Catholics and other Christian groups in a press conference. Um, and clearly there was never uh, an intention uh, to, to show disrespect to uh, any uh, religious group. If people uh, have taken any offense, uh, we are of course really, really sorry. It was just a message supporting the French Republican values. In France, we're allowed to love who we want, how we want. France, while proud of its rich Catholic heritage, also has a long tradition of secularism and anti-clericalism. Another scene in the opening ceremony involved a beheaded queen Marie-Antoinette singing revolutionary songs in the place she was executed. Sigo says this also added to the consternation. We act as if France had never been Christian, as if France had been liberated from Christianity. Christianity was martyred in France. It has been tyrannized. It has not suddenly disappeared. It has been slandered. The French cultural heritage is more than in danger. It's under attack from all sides. But I don't get the impression that people are buying it. The International Olympic Committee welcomed the clarification from the opening ceremony organizers. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And in more sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on today, especially in the Olympics. So let's start right there as U.S. gymnast Simone Biles is nursing an injured calf. What is her status for Tuesday's team finals?
Yeah, she's going to go. Now, she uh, tweaked her calf yesterday. She got taped. She's returned still the highest score on both the floor uh, and the vault exercises. And Team USA had the highest score in the qualifying rounds. They are also favored to win gold tomorrow night. Biles, meanwhile, is going to be in all four team events as the floor, the vault, the uneven barms, and the balance beam. Now, how this works, each team has three players for each of the four events, and every score counts. Now, the U.S. won gold in 2012 and 2016, but they finished silver three years ago in what was considered a very disappointing finish. Meanwhile, the U.S. men's gymnastic team won bronze today. That's their better uh, best finish since taking gold in 2008. Hmm. Well, speaking of gold, U.S. men's basketball coach Steve Kerr had to explain why Jason Tatum didn't play yesterday. What was the reason given? Well, essentially, they're a loaded team, and they played against Serbia, which stars the best center, maybe the best player in the world in Nikola Jokic. And they're also strong at guard. Now, meanwhile, Tatum's a small forward. They just didn't need him, and it really is a position as much. I mean, it's a good problem to have. Instead, they had Kevin Durant ahead of him, and he was incredible. Hit his first eight shots, scored 23 points in just 17 minutes. I think most people really credit him as sparking that win. I mean, this game was close through most of, the, most of the first half, but the U.S. ran away with it at the end, won by 26. Now, Kerr said Tatum will play in their next game Wednesday against South Sudan. He didn't say if anyone would be sitting, but of course, whoever is sitting on this team, it's a team of all-stars, it's going to be news, whoever has to sit out. Looking at a rivalry that spilled over into these Olympics, Novak Djokovic beat Rafael Nadal today to advance to the third round. Is there an expectation that this was probably their last meeting? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Nadal is 38. He's missed most of the last year and a half with injuries. And when he has played, he hasn't quite been at the same level as he was previously. And he said this could be his last year on tour. Certainly with his relative struggles, that's seeming pretty likely. But in this match, Djokovic dominated the first set. He won it 6-1. Looked like he would cruise to win. Nadal did make it close in the second, tied it at four before Djokovic won the final two games. Now, this was our 60th all-time meeting. Meeting. That's more than any duo in history. Djokovic has a slight lead with 31-29. Now for Djokovic, I mean, he already has more Grand Slam titles than anybody else. More Winks ranked number one than anybody else. But he has yet to win an Olympic gold. So that's plenty to play for for him here. Shifting gears to tomorrow's Olympic events, what can we expect to see? And is where are we at in the medal tracker? Well, right now, the U.S. has the most overall medals with 20. Uh, now, the most golds actually is Japan has six, and then France, China, Australia, and South Korea have five. The U.S. is actually back with only three. But the U.S. leads in silvers with eight and bronze with nine. Now, the U.S. got silver and bronze in men's skateboarding today, courtesy of Jagger Eaton and Nigel Houston. In men's swimming, they got a couple of bronze as well. Ryan Murphy and Luke Hobson and women's swimming. Katie Grimes and Emma Wyatt finished silver and bronze in the 400 meter individual medley. Tomorrow, like I said, we'll have the U.S. women's gymnastics competing for gold. That'll be at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then we also have the men's soccer team plays Guinea at 1 p.m. We also have um, Katie Ledecky, the de very decorated U.S. swimmer. She's going to be in the 1500 meter freestyle. She's a reigning champion, reigning Olympic champion, and the world record holder in this event. Now, that'll be at 5 a.m. The finals, though, will be on a Wednesday afternoon. So, a lot going on still. Well, Davis, always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. There are over 3 million cleverly hidden containers all over the world just waiting to be found, all in public spaces. They're part of the world's largest treasure hunt called geocaching. You can start by looking in your own neighborhood. And it is Helen Billings has more on the story. If you're looking for a fun way to get outside, there's a treasure hunt happening right outside your door. It's called geocaching. According to the website geocaching.com, to get started, you download the official geocaching app and sign up to see all the locations with hidden caches nearby. Each hidden cache is a small adventure to find a container that is camouflaged to blend into the surrounding area. Each container varies in size and contains a log designed to prove you found it, so bring a pen. In some locations, you can find small items to trade along with trackable items meant for you to move to another geocache. NTD talked to Dave Renard, who geocached with his three daughters. He said it's not about the items you find, it's about the experience. We'd go up in the Shell Ridge open space and hike the ridge lines, and uh, it's just beautiful. Again, it's a reason to get out either in the early morning or late afternoon with the kids. and. Um, you'd see wildlife, uh, even rattlesnakes. So we'd always bring a stick with us or a hiking pole. And so before you go flipping over rocks or sticking your hand in a hole, you want to 
poke around a little bit and make sure that there's no, nothing in there. The adventure starts by clicking on a location in the app, and with GPS, it will navigate you there. Once on site, to find the cache, the website says to look high and low and for something that seems out of place. The container might be a fake rock on the ground or a fake pine cone in a tree, while some caches on nature trails are hidden in the brush. In addition, Renard said geocaching can take you to places you might not normally go. We took a road trip around California, um, all the way up to Eureka and back down through Shasta and all of that. And one of the things we did was we, when we stopped by the ocean or something, we'd pull up the app and we'd find a cache and we'd go hike, you know, to go find it. Daniela Renard, Dave's wife, mentioned how geocaching was a good activity for her daughters to unplug and just be kids. It got them out in the sunshine, breathing fresh air, seeing butterflies and flowers, getting muddy and chatting about life. It's good, wholesome, and thrilling. Uh, thrilling because it's a treasure hunt, and wholesome because it doesn't involve a screen with games or shows or websites that are possibly PG-13 or for mature audiences only. It was a refreshingly beautiful, non-competitive activity. Some caches may be hard to find, while others may require a long hike. So check the difficulty and terrain before you go, and remember to place the geocache back where you found it. Helen Billings, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. For around the clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.